Section number seven of Mellor of the Silver Hand and other stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Mellor of the Silver Hand and other stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. News of the Noel. News of a fair and marvelous thing. The snow in the street and the wind on the door. Noel, 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 we sing. Christmas morning in the city of Tours. Seven hundred years ago, all night long its narrow streets have been crowded with wayfarers. All through the morning hours its churches have been thronged with worshippers of the holy babe. Since the cathedral bells rang their merry peal for the midnight mass, the snow has not ceased to fall. But now at the dawn of day, and as the minster bells ring out again for the mass of the aurora, the sky begins to clear. The silent storm of snow is spent. But what a festal garment of white it has woven for house, roof, and gable, for turret and tower and spire. What a spotless wool-like carpet it has spread over every street and lane and bridge of this royal city. Far away from the cathedral, in the chapel of his kingly castle, the good Count of Mans has kept a night-long vigil with his knights and squires and pages. There he has heard the solemn matins and louds of the nativity and the grand mass of midnight. There he and his attendants have remained until a little before daybreak, only to form in devout procession and pass through the snow-covered city to the minster walls. Banners of silk and gold hang from the cathedral towers, and the ringing of its deep-toned bells fills the city with sound. Comes mingling with the Christmas chimes the blare of silver trumpets, and the muffled tramp of many horses on the fresh-fallen snow. The progress of the royal party has begun. A splendid, shifting scene is this early morning procession through the long narrow crooked streets of the city out from the gates of the castle built by henry the second of england past the huge tower of charlemagne in which his queen lies buried over the narrow bridge that spans the loire on to the cathedral founded by the great saint martin once the bishop now the patron the glory and the pride of tours a lovely moving picture the people think as they crowd the river banks and line the tortuous streets and press about the minister's western door for upon the snowy background gleam a hundred ruddy tints the cherry colored silk of the boy pages the scarlet of the men at arms the peach-colored velvet of the knights, and last all the royal purple, half concealed with folds of the ermine, whiter than the snow upon the streets. Denser grows the crowd as the van of the procession reaches the cathedral precincts. It is natural that the people of Tours should wish to see their ruler, since it is only upon the greater feasts of the church he comes amongst them natural indeed that they should wish to gaze upon one whose greatest pleasure is to do honor to the king of heaven one who for his own glory would scorn to make eternal show but whose delight it is publicly to proclaim himself the vassal of the king of kings already the pages have dismounted and left their horses to the care of the grooms. A great space is kept before the minster door for the royal entry. 
but the people press and surge about the walls and many struggle in vain to get a foremost place upon the fringe of the crowd one small boy has just succeeded in forcing himself to the front and stands close pressed against a buttress within a few feet of the cathedral entrance a pale-faced lad of fourteen and by his dress a scholar and a cleric the hood falls back from his head as he emerges from the mass of waiting people and his tonsure is plainly visible he is shivering with cold now as he stands exposed to the full force of the north wind and his short cassock and thin black mantle are verily a poor protection from the biting breeze yet it is clear that he is radiantly happy excitement or the cold has brought a faint tinge of color to his pallid cheeks and his dark eyes shine and glisten as he assures himself that he is within easy reach of the great porch and that there is no fear of his being unable to follow the procession once it has passed into the cathedral he is not at all indifferent to the pageant that is approaching but although he has served at the altar of one of the city churches thrice this morning he longs to assist at the mass of the aurora in the minster purinitus s nobis he keeps whispering to himself as though it were the burden of some sweet song he could not forget purinitus s nobis et philin datus s nobis a child is born to us a son is given to us the joy of this little tonsured cleric is the true christmas joy if the boy so lately born bring any other happiness well and good but it was the birth itself that brought such joy to mary and that he made the whole world rejoice for twelve hundred years if it bring only cold and suffering well it did bring other than this to the boy who was born at midnight such were the thoughts of young martin the little clerk of tours as he stood shivering by the minster door at the dawn of christmas morning he had no thought of envy as he watched the rosy-faced page boys in their bravery of white fur and cherry-colored silk walking to and fro between the divided crowd stamping their long fur-lined boots and making their silver spurs ring as they did so noble-looking lads they certainly were graceful and well developed in form healthy looking and beautiful in feature the sons of great lords every one of them yet proud and happy enough to hold the stirrup or the bridle of their master with basin and uter with cup and platter pious and good too it may be hoped since their lord was the model of a catholic prince and would never knowingly suffer the smallest evil to find place in his well-regulated court but though young martin not one of them is a tonsured cleric he would not change places with any one of them even if such a thing were possible far from being of noble birth martin was the son of a poor weaver living in one of the narrowest lanes in that great city yet the king of glory had chosen the weaver's son to be one of his royal pages surely it was a greater matter to serve at the altar table of god than to wait upon any earthly king and if the boys before him were looking forward to their knighthood was not he martin waiting longingly for a far more regal order than that nothing less indeed than the order of melchizedek the eternal priesthood yet there was no pride in the little scholar's heart as he thought of these things 
pure natus and nobus was still echoing in his mind and he knew that before all things mary's boy was humble meek and loving and that if he would be a true page and faithful knight of this knightly christ he also must be poor of spirit and truly humble but now the bells which for a time had ceased to peal broke forth afresh and the notes of the trumpets reached the ears of the waiting crowd the count was already in sight a little cloud of smoke floated out through the cathedral porch and a whiff of incense that sweetest of odors to the christian sense sent a new thrill of joy through the shivering young cleric he knew that the procession of priests was approaching the entrance from the interior in order to meet the count and to conduct him to the place close to the high altar martin did not envy his sovereign's pages but he found it hard to put away the wish that he were one of that band of boy clerics connected with the cathedral of his patron st martin he could see the holy water bearer from where he stood as also several of the singing boys and acolytes how beautiful were the fair white albs and amices they wore and how splendid the cloth of gold copes he knew the priests were vested in happy boys he thought to have a part in so great a function and yet said martin to himself their office is the same as mine and the holy sacrifice is everywhere the same whether it be offered at the side altar of a small church or at the high altar of a great cathedral the thought comforted him a good deal yet he could not help looking with a certain longing towards the cathedral porch and wishing that he had an office however small among the priests and clerics there assembled but now the crowd at martin's back began to surge and sway afresh for the knights had already appeared and close behind them was the count himself horses were rearing and capering as they were led away by stable boys and grooms and the men at arms were being drawn up in two long lines to form a passage for the royal procession devout looking and dignified yet with a happy smile upon his face the count rode to within a few feet of where martin was standing instinctively the boy felt that the moment their prince had entered the porch the people would press forward and crowd into the cathedral martin thought if only he could get within the entrance all would be well slipping quickly past the soldier who was now standing almost in front of him the boy gained the porch and passing bareheaded the group of ecclesiastics stationed himself far back in the corner on the right hand side of the door his boldness startled him when he realized what he had done the count himself was barely on the threshold and yet he martin had already entered he blushed a little but he was not afraid of the consequences of his action the cathedral was god's house and not the palace of any earthly king besides was martin not a cleric and could he not claim the privileges of his state had he not a sort of right to stand there among the clergy although remote from them it was true he lacked the choir dress necessary to fit him for a part in the procession but then he had no intention of joining it all he wished for was a place to pray in during the solemn offering of holy mass but the boy little thought that the sharp eyes of the count had detected his maneuver standing now bareheaded under the great doorway and bowing low as he received the holy water from the priest 
the great lord of tours paused as the procession reformed within the porch and began to move forward within the cathedral looking straight towards the corner of the porch where martin stood with his back against the wall the good count smilingly beckoned to him nervously the boy came forward and bent his knee tell me my little clerk said the count in a kindly and almost jocose tone have you any news for me there was silence for a moment during which the trembling lad looked up into the great man's face its kindly expression immediately reassured the little cleric yes sir he answered in a low but audible voice most excellent news the count started could it be that the boy before him was the bearer of some state secret a messenger perhaps disguised as a cleric quick then ejaculated the count tell me your news Pernitus S. Noblis, began the little scholar reverently, et film datus et noblis. Greatly moved and edified, the Count took the boy by the hand and raising him from his kneeling posture, said, Excellent news in truth, and news for which only the boy who is born can reward you. Let us go then and worship the new born boy for holy mass is about to begin and do you my little clerk take your place with the cathedral clergy it is meet that the child who is given to us be surrounded with the children of the church gladly enough would martin have knelt in a corner of the nave but this was not to be passing into the church the count bade him to take a place in the stalls of the choir hesitating for an instant the lad bowed low and turning up the south aisle passed into the sacristy explaining the count's message to the sacristan the latter immediately provided martin with amice and alb vesting quickly and with beating heart he passed into the choir by a side door and took himself to the remotest place he could find among the clerics of the third form his heart was full of joy and as the choir began in troit le fugit hodi super nos quita natus et dominus his voice shook as he tried to join in the singing and a stream of tears flowed down his cheeks what a delight to find himself if only for the first and last time in his life so near to the high altar of his beloved patron's church on such a day too and under such extraordinary circumstances certainly our young cleric had a hard fight with distracting thoughts during the progress of the holy sacrifice try as he would he could not but think of what had so recently happened in the porch of the cathedral the great count of mans had spoken to him and taken him by the hand had smiled upon him and finally had given him for one happy hour at least the privilege he most desired yet for one which he scarcely dared to hope how glad the boy was that the church was so huge and that he was as it were lost in that great crowd of worshippers and yet what a delight for his father and mother if they were within the building as he was almost sure they were and if they could see him here in the cathedral stalls well if these thoughts would come back to his mind no matter how often he put them away at least he was master of his sight he would not saving at the elevation of the host raise his eyes to look at any person or thing he knew the count could not be far away for on these occasions a special place was prepared for the royal party not far from the altar 
but the boy was resolved that he would not look away from the gradual which lay before him a wise resolve indeed for long before the cannon of the mass was reached martin's habitual recollection came back to him and when the great bell tolled for the elevation he could think of nothing save the mystery of the moment and the words that so sweetly haunted his memory near natus et nobis sit films datus et nobles grandly the holy rite proceeded to its close and then the boy found himself walking from the choir to the sacristy in the great procession of priests and clerics which on this occasion included every ecclesiastic belonging to the cathedral arrived there he waited with his brother clerics for the signal to unvest already the bishop had passed through the kneeling lines of canons and choristers yet the signal was not given the bishop was awaiting the arrival of the count of Mans, whose yearly custom it was to greet the clergy at the close of the mass of the aurora soon the clatter of sword scabbards was heard and the ringing of spurs and martin knew that the count and his attendants were approaching bowing low with the rest as the royal party passed by the boy did not raise his eyes to look at the count or at any of his companions the young clerk felt that sufficient honor had been paid to him that day and had no desire to attract his prince's attention a second time he rejoiced exceedingly when the bishop led his noble visitor to an inner sacristy and the signal to unrobe was at length given for many reasons martin longed to get away quickly from the minster he had another mass to assist at before noon in the church of his own parish where for several years he had served at the altar it was now long after nine in the morning and as yet he was fasting for though he had received holy communion at the midnight mass he had not left the church until the time drew near for the royal procession to the cathedral again the lad was anxious to avoid the curious questioning of the boys of the choir as to the reason of his sudden and unexpected appearance in their midst but martin was not destined to leave the cathedral so quickly he had scarcely put off his alb when one of the canons came behind him and whispered the bishop desires to see you follow me a moment later the boy found himself in the presence of the bishop of tours and the count of Mans. scarcely in the whole of christom was there a happier christmas party than that held the same day in the poor little cottage belonging to martin's father the poverty-stricken weaver of tours the noel had brought them news indeed martin for whom father and mother had made so many sacrifices and whose vocation to the priesthood had long been to them a source of mingled anxiety and delight was now a member of the great and rich cathedral establishment of tours no room now for fear lest they should be unable to supply their pious and loving little son with sufficient food and clothing no cause now for anxiety lest their pale-faced boy should be unable to continue his studies for the priesthood martin had obtained the patronage of a bishop and a prince in later years there was a canon of tours who it is said to have taken the poor of the city into his own particular keeping so great was his charity that the people declared st martin himself had come to life again but oh the activity and generosity of this canon martin at the time of christmas and the sharp lookout he kept for poor shivering little scholars 
End of section 7. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 8 of Mellor and the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mellor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. Chapter 8 A Beloved Pupil. It was the noon of night and the holy hermit of Kulros was saying matins. Not far from his solitary cell, the waves broke upon the shore with their monotonous and soothing rhythm, and made a fitting accompaniment to St. Sylvan's midnight praises. Solitary indeed was the hermit, solitary his abode, yet above the low chant of his night hours, above the booming of the wind about his hut, above the breaking of the waves upon the beach the holy man heard voices not for one moment did he pause in the recitation of his psalms scarcely for an instant ceased these strange sweet voices of the night to one whose life is given over to the direct praise of his creator and to commerce with a great multitude of unseen and heavenly witnesses it is not surprising if like adam he hears the voice of god when sounds of earth are stilled or if there should reach his ears the chanting of the spirits of just men made perfect to-night saint servan did not doubt that he had caught an echo of the lauds of the angels but as soon as he had finished his nocturnes the hermit left his cell and passed out into the pale gray light of early dawn strange sounds still lingered in the air and as the hermit made his way to the seashore there came to his ear the wailing of a little child pressing quickly forward he saw a sight that filled him with pity and compassion a girl lay on the sea-washed stones clasping to her heart a newly born child to get help for the babe and mother was the holy man's first duty and soon both were brought to a place of shelter terrible was the story the woman little more than a girl had to tell her name was themen and she was a princess the daughter of loth king of the picts by her father's orders she had been thrown from a steep rock at mount dunpeld poor sinner as she was the good god had compassion on her she was found lying uninjured at the foot of the rock and her father ordered her to be sent to the wild and desolate region of Colross. The holy man's care for the child and his mother did not end with the providing of food and shelter and clothing. The girl was uninstructed and unbaptized. Bitterly she bewailed her sin, and when St. Servan was satisfied that she had become a true penitent, he baptized her and her little one, giving to her the name of Tanka and to the boy that of Kenijern, or Kenierne, which means chief lord. Though Servan had been spoken of as a hermit, it is certain that he became an abbot, and that as so frequently happened his cell developed into a monastery. He was joined by other monks, and the abbey of Colross became a place well known for piety and learning. It is small wonder that the little Kinnijern should cling to the holy man who had not only saved his earthly life, but had been the means of his acquiring a right to the life eternal. Great was the love between the old man and the little child, and right gladly did the mother leave her son within the sacred shelter of Colross. And the boy grew and became very dear to God. Gentle and affectionate, humble and obedient was mungo the dearly loved one as the abbot always called him and gave promise of becoming both learned and saintly wild indeed was the scotland of the sixth century wild and uncouth were its inhabitants but the monks labored hard to civilize the boys who were sent to them and to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the lord 
We may easily imagine what a hard time the gentle little Kinnegern would have among a herd of half-savage lowland laddies. The well-known legends of the saint that have come down to us doubtless had their origin in the lawless bullying of his schoolmates. In the old times the striking of a light was often a lengthy and difficult task, and in consequence of this fires were seldom allowed to die out. One of the duties of the lads at the abbey was that each in turn should rise in the night to throw more wood on the kitchen hearth, and to replenish the oil in the church lamps. One night, when it was Kinnegern's turn to fulfill this duty, some of the lads rose before him and carefully extinguished the fire. But the beloved one did not suffer. Miraculously or otherwise, he obtained a light to the confusion of the boys who wanted to get him punished. The well-known legend of the robin is more startling still. It was the abbot's pet bird and lived in his cell. One day the young barbarians wrung the little red-breast's neck and told the abbot that his mungo had done the deed. Greatly distressed, Kennegarn took into his hands the body of the mangled bird, and, raising his tearful, prayerful eyes to heaven, implored the Almighty to give back life to the abbot's pet. Nothing is too small, nothing too great, for the good God to do when a saint prays as only a saint can pray, and Kennegurn did not ask in vain. No wonder these coarse laddies became afraid to play tricks upon their saintly schoolmate. When one author tells us that Kinnegern ran away because he was unable to endure longer the envy of his fellow pupils, another assures us that he was sent to Glasgow by the abbot St. Servan in order to work for God. However this may be, we know that the day of his departure was the saddest of his life, and that of his beloved master and spiritual father. One account says that the abbot ran after him only to find that the boy had already crossed the river. Alas, my dearest son, cried St. Servan, the light of my eyes and the staff of my age, wherefore hast thou deserted me? Remember that I took thee from thy mother's womb, nursed thee and taught thee to this day. Do not desert my white hairs. My father! called out Kinnegurn through his tears. It is the will of the Most High that I should go. Come back, come back, my dearest, cried the abbot. From being a father I will be to thee a son. Instead of being a master I will become your disciple. My father, it cannot be, answered the boy, sobbing very bitterly. I must go where the Lord calls me. The love of a saint is as deep as it is true, but there is nothing of self in it. That which so many unhappy men and women call love of one another is often nothing but unblushing and undisguised selfishness. True affection makes no account of self. The love that existed between these two holy souls was as deep as the ocean. Each of them wished what was best for the other, not what was most pleasing to himself. Bitter and terrible as the parting was, each at length understood that God willed it. So the abbot raised his hands and sent his blessing across the river. Slowly and sorrowfully they parted, never again in this life to meet one another face to face. The subsequent adventures of St. Kentigern were many and remarkable. God had called him to be an apostle, and, though like so many holy men and boys, he began his apostolate in a cave, people sought him out and listened to his teaching. He soon converted many to God, and even when he brought kings into the fold of the church and found himself consecrated bishop of Glasgow, he continued to live in a rocky cell with a stone for his pillow. From this primitive palace he went forth to preach, a wooden unadorned pastoral staff in one hand, an office book in the other, on foot through the country, passing from the Clyde to the Firth of Froth, living on bread and cheese and milk. 
driven from his native country by a rebellion st kinnegern took refuge in wales with the great st david remaining with him until the building of the famous monastery then called elan elwyn and afterward st asaph disciples and scholars flocked to this abbey in great numbers and kentigern remained here until after the death of st david in 544 and until roderick the king of the north britons begged the bishop of glasgow to return to his see so kentigern left his abbey in the care of st asaph and returned to the land of his birth bringing with him a devoted band of british monks besides beginning the building of a cathedral at glasgow Killigern labored to bring back to the faith the Picts of Galloway and founded numerous missions and religious houses. His relations with the famous and holy Columba, abbot of Iona, were of the most interesting kind, and there has come down to us a beautiful account of the meeting of these two saints and their followers at Glasgow. St. Columba arrived with a great company of monks, and as they entered Glasgow the abbey divided them into three big choirs. In the same way St. Kentigern met him with three great bodies of boys and monks and aged fathers. First came the children of the choir, then the brethren who had reached manhood, and last of all the snowy-haired elders among whom Kentigern took his place they shall sing in the ways of the lord that great is the glory of the lord the path of the just is made and the way of the saints is prepared chanted the choirs of glasgow immediately they were answered by the monks of iona the saints shall go from strength to strength and unto the god of gods appeareth every one of them in sion then the apostle of the picts affectionately embraced the apostle of the scots and the two saints spent several days together in sacred conference saint kentigern died in the year 601 at the age of 85 in life and after death he was famed for miracles his feast is kept on the 13th of january the legend of the robin has been put into charming verse by miss may probin god keep thee little kentigern sitting in the school quickly the master will return thou hast not broken the rule from thy task thou hast not stirred but the rest have slain the master's bird the little bird with the breast of red that perched on the master's shoulder and picked from his hand the crumbs of bread each morning waxing bolder but the thoughtless lads as he flew by have chased and caught him boisterously they have snatched him from each other's hold they have pulled off his head rent is the tuneful throat of gold in twain he falleth dead drops of red on the white flags lie and the steps of the master draweth nigh god keep thee little kentigern standing out on the floor the coward lads each in his turn have accused thee o'er and o'er for sake of a little bird's red blood thou art to taste the master's rod the child hath asked that he may take in his hand the dead thing small he joineth the head to the little neck white-lipped the lads grow all lo the bird has preened its pretty wing glanced up glanced down and begun to sing End of section 8. This recording by Phil Chenever. Section 9 of Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. Mellor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. Chapter 9 A Child of the Camp. The camp life of the sixth century seemed scarcely fitted for the rearing of so delicate a boy as Dositheus the Page. Happily for the child, his master acted the part of a true foster father, ever regarding the lad's welfare with careful solicitude. 
Dositheus had no knowledge of the Christian religion, and the soldiers with whom he lived could teach him nothing. But the boy had the curiosity belonging to his tender age, and when in all the bravery of scarlet and gold he bore the cup and waited upon his master at the banquet, he listened eagerly to the conversation of the guests as it turned upon foreign service and travels in the distant east. He was naturally intelligent, and his master liked to answer his questions, liked the boy who stood at his right hand and bore his cup to show an interest in the talk of the table. A strange life, certainly, for this well-born lad, and in some respects a happy one, for his master's affection seems to have been of a true kind, and Dositheus had every reason to look upon him as a father and a friend. Now it happened on a certain day that the conversation at mess turned upon Jerusalem, and Dositheus marveled much to hear it called the Holy City. His curiosity was excited, and he wondered why this place of all others should be regarded as sacred. Making no secret of his longing to see it, he found, to his great joy, that not only was his master's friend about to start for the east, but that he was going to visit Jerusalem. And my Dositheus would like to journey thither, would he not? His master inquired, seeing the longing in his page's face. Yea, master, would I not love to go there? The boy answered. Then, my son, you shall journey with the traveller as his page, said the good-hearted officer. Now when the man and the boy had arrived at Jerusalem, one of the first places Dositheus visited was that garden of Gethsemane wherein our divine Lord suffered his bitter agony. And at that period there was set up in the holy place a terrible and a wonderful picture showing the torments of hell and the punishments of those souls who had made the sufferings of Jesus Christ of no effect. Not at all understanding the meaning of this awful painting, the boy found himself unable to tear himself away from it. He appears to have been alone at this time, for a strange lady near him, seeing his astonishment, came up to him and began to explain the meaning of what he was gazing upon. "'And is one obliged to go there?' he asked plaintively. "'Nay, my child,' she answered. The good God wishes none to go there. Only the wicked are found in hell, and those who will not let Jesus Christ save them. Then came from Dositheus the question of questions, that cry of the heart which will be heard from all men to the end of time. What shall I do to be saved? This was the beginning of the lad's conversion, as it is of the turning to God of so many. Fear of the unknown, fear of punishment, fear of hell, a blessed fear, even if its motive be an imperfect one, since it so often leads to that love which destroys all fear, saving the filial and reverential. Willingly and eagerly does Cetheus listen to the lady's instruction in the great truths of religion. Promptly and fervently he began to fast and to pray. It mattered nothing to him that his traveling companions laughed at him. But when they asked him if he was going to be a monk, he had to say, What is a monk? He had never heard of the monastic life, but when it was explained to him, he lost no time in paying a visit to the nearest religious house, which was that governed by St. Cerides. The abbot Cerides shook his head when Dositheus begged to be received forthwith into the community of Gaza. The holy man looked compassionately upon the boy in his rich dress, and could not but see that the young page was of a delicate constitution, and that he had been accustomed to enjoy most of the luxuries of life. Everything seemed to be against the reception of the lad into so austere a community, Yet the earnestness and good will of Dositheus were evident. Indeed, he would not be refused, 
and at length St. Cerides handed him over to that wonderfully holy man, Dorotheus the Archmandrite, who was at that time master of novices. Dorotheus soon saw that his new pupil in the science of the saints was much too delicate to practice the austerities which were common everyday matters at that time. So the saintly man began by correcting the lad's self-will, and by teaching him how to govern a somewhat unruly and hitherto undisciplined tongue. For it must be remembered that Dositheus was a very recent convert to the Catholic faith, and that he had entered religion before he had had time to correct the faults of his past life, and to break himself of the many bad habits he had acquired by living among soldiers. Very gently and prudently did the novice master begin to check the faults of his young charge. Unaccustomed to place any restraint upon himself in the matter of eating, and no doubt encouraged by his late indulgent master to enjoy the good things of the table, Dositheus was now taught how to practice a little mortification. "'How much have you eaten today, my son?' inquired Dorotheus some time after the lad's admission to the monastery. "'A loaf and a half, father,' the boy replied. "'This was five or six pounds weight of bread.' "'That is pretty fair,' said the good man with a smile. "'Suppose, my child, you take a trifle less than that tomorrow.' Now the delightful thing about Dositheus was that he always obeyed and tried to do so, and for this very reason everybody loved him. He took a little less on the morrow, and St. Dorotheus asked him how he felt in consequence. "'Quite well, my father,' the boy said. And then the novice master told him always to take what was necessary, but not more than that. After some time the lad found that half a pound of bread was quite sufficient for his needs. Soon after this, Dositheus was sent to wait upon the sick. He was such a bright, cheerful lad that those who were ill loved to have him about them and thanked God for sending them a nurse so attentive and so merry. But saints are not made in a day, and sometimes the suffering are querulous and exacting. More than once, Dositheus lost his temper and used language that had been familiar enough to soldiers, but which was never heard in a community of monks. After these little falls, the poor lad was very downhearted and repented bitterly. On one occasion, he ran from the infirmary to his cell, and throwing himself on the floor, wept long and bitterly. Indeed, he would not be comforted until St. Dorotheus came to him and assured him that when we are sorry for our sins, God always forgives, and that it is not so much the falling into sin that we ought to fear as the remaining in it. In many little ways, Dositheus was a trial to those with whom he lived, for among other things his camp life had made him somewhat noisy. One day the novice master heard him shouting in the infirmary itself. Brother, said Dorotheus, go and ask for a bottle of wine. Dositheus ran to get the wine and soon returned with it to the saint. No, my son, said Dorotheus, as the lad presented him with the flask. I don't want the wine. It is for you yourself. The rollicking goths, you know, shout and drink. I heard you shouting, and it seemed to me that all you needed in order to be a thorough goth was a bottle of liquor. It did not require much imagination to see the boy blushing for shame and begging his master's pardon. The incident describes only one of many similar attempts on the part of St. Dorotheus to train his young pupil in the way of sanctity. Sometimes... The holy man thought it good to put on a harshness of look and manner which was not natural to him, for there were moments when the lad seemed to need a certain severity of treatment. Like all boys and most men, Dositheus now and then gave way to boasting. "'Look here, father,' 
he called one day to his master who had just entered the infirmary just see how beautifully i've made these beds ah yes replied the saint you are certainly a good bedmaker but i don't think much of you as a monk a real monk doesn't boast there was still a good deal of the child left in docetius in spite of his efforts to lead a life of perfection and one may say in spite of many successes one day the steward of the monastery gave him a knife quite inordinately pleased with it he showed it to st dorotheus let me look at it said the saint taking it into his hand to examine it it is just the very thing for cutting up my bread isn't it father the boy asked are you very much delighted with this knife the old man questioned i should just think so father docetius replied then my child i think you had better give it away let some other monk have it don't you touch it again without the least demur the boy obeyed and doubtless st dorotheus rejoiced in his heart to see the progress his disciple had made in the hardest of all the virtues virtue is not virtue until it is tried and trifling as these little mortifications may seem they were true tests of obedience and the sacrifice of self-will docetius was too delicate to flog himself much with whipcord or to go about with irons on his limbs or even perhaps to wear haircloth he was not strong enough to watch all night in prayer or to keep the rigorous fasts of his order but he asked and obtained strength to do something much harder and much better something to which these austerities are after all only a help he could obey he could run counter to his own will he could give up things for the love of god he could receive a rebuke without resenting it these are the things that help to make the saint but he had to be proved and his novice master was ingenious in putting the lad's virtue to the test i shall send brother docetius to you today said st dorotheus to the abbot serides please pretend to be cross with him and send him away roughly i want to see how far he has advanced now at that time the young novice was studying the holy scriptures and was wont to go to his master with any passage that he could not understand i can't attend to you exclaimed dorotheus when the boy came to his cell book in hand go to the abbot so dositheus went to the abbot quite humbly and begged him to explain the words of a difficult passage get away with you said the abbot boxing his ears do you think i have nothing to do but teach an ignorant fellow like you it was anything but a light trial to which he was subjected so it seemed to the boy that both these holy men had been angry with him for merely doing his duty however he went back to his own cell without showing any sign of resentment and quite determined not to let the remembrance of this seemingly unkind treatment rankle in his mind and says the chronicler of this story no sooner had he reached his cell than the good god gave him light to penetrate and understand the portion of holy scripture that he was reading five years passed away and Asetheus was a young man his progress in things spiritual had been great but he had not outgrown the delicacy of constitution which was so apparent in his boyhood he began to spit blood and to show alarming signs of consumption somebody told him that a diet of raw eggs would stop the hemorrhage but he begged his superior not to allow him to try this remedy for at first the idea of this cure had pleased him greatly and above all things he wished to make a sacrifice of his own will seeing him so earnest in desiring the prohibition and possibly knowing that the young man would not be much benefited by taking the eggs st dorotheus said very well my son but you shall make trial of every other possible remedy 
but the disease gained upon him and it soon became evident that god was calling him out of life be constant in prayer my child said dorotheus as the youth grew worse do not let go of prayer dositheus replied that all was well with him and begged for his master's prayers but when he had grown very weak and the old man asked him if he could still pray he replied pardon me my father i find it very hard to pray do not be afraid my son said the old monk and do not force yourself to formal prayer only have our lord jesus present in your heart a few days afterwards dositheus turned to dorotheus and said my father i can bear no more then replied the saint go in peace my child and stand in the presence of the most blessed trinity and pray for us saint dorotheus must have marveled at the obtuseness of some of the monks who could not understand why he had spoken to dositheus as if he were a saint father said they you promised him paradise yet he did not fast he did not mortify his body and we never heard of any miracles that he performed nothing is more disheartening to a teacher than to perceive that some of his lessons have been misunderstood and some of his very first principles misconceived Dorotheus could have retorted very sharply upon these good but somewhat wooden men. However, he only reminded them that if Dositheus had not fasted or practiced austerities, he had done something much more difficult, something that is a better test of sanctity than is the working of miracles. He had given up his own will. Soon after the young saint's death, it chanced that an old monk in the infirmary was praying that god would show him all the holy men of that house who had already entered into paradise his prayer was heard and he saw a vast choir of white-haired monks and conspicuous among them one young lay brother with the dark abundant hair of youth and a hectic flush upon his cheeks when he told his vision to some who had so foolishly doubted the sanctity of their departed brother they said without a doubt our dositheus has entered heaven end of section nine section ten of meller of the silver hand and other stories of bright ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc meller of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages by david byrne a minstrel's ministry one even when he was a young boy in saint cadell's delightful school at lincarvan hyvarnian had been known as the little sage no small number of our british forefathers god gave the gift of song not merely the inferior capacity of playing and singing but that immeasurably higher endowment of creation and invention like his holy master cadot and many others that period hyvarnian was a poet as well as a minstrel a sage as well as a singer and because his teachers and schoolmates willingly gave him the distinguishing title of swordvek the little bard there can be no doubt that at quite an early age he began to show very remarkable powers of thought genuine lover of poetry and music was cadot and his regard for this gifted pupil was marked no doubt the abbot hoped that like so many other well-endowed boys hyvarnian would one day submit his curly locks to the church's shears and be crowned with the tonsure of the monk for the lad was humble and modest pious and obedient and seemed to be blessed with all the qualities that the saint required in those who offered themselves at his subjects indeed 
full of admiration for the young bard's wisdom and power of improvisation saint cadoc one day ventured to engage with him a sort of contest of song on the subject of the moral virtues it was an interesting and moving spectacle there in the big cloister school in the presence of all the monks and the boys harp in hand the saintly abbot confronted the little school lad and enumerating the eighteen leading virtues with which a true follower of jesus christ ought to be adorned bade hivernian complete the list for one so young it was no light task to try and add to the eloquent and exhausted speech of the saintly and learned abbot nevertheless as soon as his master had finished the little minstrel struck his own harp and began to sing ever the highest is he who is strongest when he is tried he is the virtuous man who is patient in bearing his cross he who is quick to act yet modest when he succeeds he who is humble of heart and persists in the way that is straight ready to labor and strive headless of all that affrights ever longing for learning generous to the untaught kind in thought and in speech a door of beautiful deeds a maker of peace in strife pure in body and mind to strangers courteous mild affable ever at board just in his daily speech just in his hourly deed strict to observe the law of the body of christ the church pitiful to the poor and to all who suffer wrong the boy ceased, and bowing his head, knelt at his master's feet. Nay, said Cadot, with tears in his eyes, be not fearful, my child. Verily thine is the prize. In this contest, Hyvarian, I freely acknowledge thee the victor. Not so, my master, said the lad, raising his eyes for a moment to the abbot's face. I try to surpass thee, I an ignorant young boy thine holy father is the victory for is awarding me the prize though art but making proof of the possession of true humility no person present ever forgot one detail of that striking scene it seemed to the monks that the saint was striving with saint a great shout rang through the hall hearty british and irish cheers both for their comrade and for the abbot even when the assembly broke up and the young bard's schoolfellows flocked about him to offer their congratulations hivernian would not accept the victory tis the abbot's own teaching he said modestly what should i know of the virtues but for him and is he not a living example of all that i put in my song nay but i did but sing in my own feeble language the great truths that we all learnt sitting here at his feet who of us can ever forget the verses he has taken such pains to teach us let us repeat some of them as we walk added hyvarthian as the crowd left the cloister and sauntered into the open and on their way to the playing field now one and now another of the lads led by hyvarnian chanted in a lusty rebel the following aphorisms truth is the elder daughter of god without light nothing is good without light there is no piety without light there is no religion without light there is no faith the sight of god that is life two we may imagine with what reluctance the abbot parted from his little sage but the day came when Hyvarnian had to confess that he felt no call to the life of a monk. Anxious as he was to serve God faithfully, he could not bind himself to the vows of religion. And just because Cadot was a genuine saint, he had no narrow and rigid priest. Dearly as he would have liked to retain this gifted and God-living lad, the abbot thought, it the most natural thing in the world that his pupil should desire to see men and cities 
and make some trial of the talents God had bestowed upon him. Even when the holy man reflected upon the nature of these talents, and remembered how easily they might be put to perilous uses, he did not overlook the fact that God does not ask one man to play providence over another. Like all truly good and wise men, he had a horror of trying to force a vocation, and well understood that to one not called of God, the life of the cloister might prove more dangerous than the life of a court. Moreover, he knew Harvernian. Young as the boy was, he had acquired very solid virtues. The abbey was no forcing house, no hotbed of piety, but a Christian school in which lads were taught to live holily, and so whatever the circumstances of their after life might be, they should prove themselves strong in the hour of trial. A hearty, manly, prayerful life was that of the sixth-century schoolboy, calculated to make the weak character strong and the strong character heroic. At this period, Saxon England offered no scope, no fitting career for a boy like Hyvarnian. Very slowly, indeed, was it being converted to the Catholic faith. Almost impersonally was it changing its barbarian habits. But now that Chibert had become king of the Franks, there was something akin to civilization in Gaul, and doubtless, after many cognitation and many prayers, to Paris would Cadot send the young genius who was so dear to him. It is probable that at this time the boy was about fourteen, and that he spent at least four years at the court of Chilbert. His office was a high one and an honorable. No mere buffoon was this British lad whose voice could make rough men weep, and the sound of whose harp string could bring gladness to the sadness of hearts. No court jester was the pupil of the abbot of Licarvian, but a poet who sang the themes of both high and holy, and who among the mixed crowd of courtiers exercised a ministry of song calculated to make men ashamed of their vices, and to give them some understanding of the exceeding beauty of holiness. Great and to some extent perilous, for this young Briton was a change from the hard fare and stern discipline of the cloister school to the freedom and luxury of a royal palace. Happily the teaching of his holy master and the virtuous habits formed in his childhood stood him in good stead. St. Cadot's words had sunk deep down into the young minstrel's heart. Gaul, too, had its saints at this period, and the pure-hearted boy knew by happy experience how lovingly helpful holy men could be. But a day came when Hibernian felt a mighty longing to revisit the land of his birth. With a great desire he pined to see once again his beloved master and the beauty and peacefulness of Lincarvian. He had grown into a tall and handsome youth, strong and sturdy, and no longer could he sing in the dulcet treble of his boyhood. So with the king's permission, Hiverian left the court and traveled from Paris to Brittany, where he felt sure of getting a boat that would sooner or later land him on the shores of Britain. But there was some delay in getting the necessary craft, and the young man became the guest of Con Moore, Chilgren's vice grant in Brittany, an honored guest, too, and one for whom fitting entertainment must be provided. So there were hunting parties and the killing of wild boar and deer, and it was during one of these hunts there befell the minstrel an adventure that changed the whole course of his career. Riding one day through the forest, he, who so greatly appreciated the magic of musical sounds, found himself intently listening to the singing of the most beautiful treble voice he had ever heard. Checking his horse, he remained motionless for a space, drinking in every note of this enchanting vocal music. It was the voice of a country maiden, and as the man listened his heart grew soft and tender. 
Pushing his way through the green boughs and the undergrowth, he soon found himself standing in a sunny glade by the maiden's side, and this was the refrain of her song. There by the water flowing, close to the streamlet's side, like the blue iris growing, yet one shall call me his bride. Truly, thought the young man, I am now of an age when the honest wooing of a bride might be blessed by God and by his church. Modestly and respectfully he greeted her. Tell me what flowers thou gatherest, he began to say, blushing more deeply than did the startled damsel herself. But how white and fair art thou, and how sweetly thou singest. These are herbs, young sir, she replied in a low voice. They are simples and not flowers. One drives away sadness, another banishes blindness. It is said there is one that overcomes death. Verily, thought the minstrel, this maiden, as wise as she is beautiful, and, if I mistake not, wise with the wisdom of heaven. Little queen, he said to her, Will you not give me of your simples? Nay, sir, she quickly replied, I will give them to no man, saving to him who shall be my spouse. But will you not permit me to be your spouse? asked Hyvarnian with great simplicity. And even as she hesitated and turned away the young man's host, missing him from the hunt, rode hastily into the glade with great simplicity, and even as she hesitated and turned away, Oh, Conmore, explained the youth, here is the only maiden I ever loved. Will you not help me to persuade her to be my own true wife? But Ravignon, the lady of simples and of the song, already loved the handsome and richly clad man who treated her with such reverence and courtesy. So Chilbert's viceroy rode home and gave orders for a magnificent wedding banquet, and very soon Hivernian and Rivenon were made man and wife, and so happily were they that Cadot's pupil forgot his own country and his father's house and exchanged the Britain of his birth for the Brittany of his adoption. After three years of blissful living, a new joy came to them in the birth of a son. But the joy was tinged with sorrow, for, alas, the boy was blind. Yet his father and mother loved him all the more tenderly for this affliction. And as he lay wailing in his little crib, each in turn would speak to him and soothe him with song. Night and day they sang to him, and always would he cease to weep and try to show how much he delighted in sweet sounds. They had called him Herve which signifies bitterness, but in the love and care of their child they both found a surpassing sweetness. 3. When Herve was two years old, his mother experienced the greatest sorrow of her life. Hyvarian, her devoted and beloved husband, Hyvarian, the strong and handsome minstrel, was seized with a fatal sickness and soon passed out of life. Her grief was very great, and her condition became exceedingly pitiful. She had no parents living and no well-to-do friends. Rejoicing in his young manhood and in his strength and always successful in earning by his music everything that he needed, Hyvarian had made no provision for the wife and child he loved so tenderly. The little blind boy now became his mother's only earthly consolation. He grew up with that extraordinary love of all things holy, which in some children is a special endowment of heaven. From both father and mother he inherited the gift of poetry and music, as well as great personal beauty of form and feature. Before he was seven years old, his one anxiety was to comfort and help his mother. When he reached that truly tender age, he at once began to try and earn his living. For fourteen hundred years have the Bretons sung the praises of little Herve. He is the hero of many of their prettiest and most pathetic ballads, still chanted around Breton farmhouse firesides on windy nights. 
still recited beneath shady trees on summer days in one of these songs they described the golden-haired sightless little bard of seven led about by a white dog standing shivering in the wind and rain and snow with no sabots on his bare feet and scarce able to raise his voice in song for the trembling of his poor little limbs and the chattering of his teeth they also sing a certain song of souls composed by irv at his father's grave on the evening of the feast of all saints they tell to how on returning home cold and weary his feet slipped and he fell on the wet soil and with a wounded and bleeding mouth sought the protecting arms of his mother it was when herve reached the age of fourteen that a great change took place in his daily life and in that of his mother loving her as he did and earning whatever money he could for her support and for his own he must have guessed that her heart was now wholly weaned from the things of this world and that now and again she turned longing eyes toward a certain cloister home where many holy women were living under religious rule yet knowing how too dear he was to that widowed mother he felt sure that unless he told her of his own yearnings to devote himself more directly to god's service she would never dream of taking a step that would separate her from him all time so one day he spoke to her very tenderly and lovingly, reminding her of the strange, wandering life he had led since he was a little child of seven, and telling her how much he longed to go to some solitary place where he could sing the praises of God and hear no music but that of the offices of the church. She listened to him in silence, and with fast-falling tears, for though his own desires were so perfectly in union with her own the thought of being separated from her afflicted darling was almost more than she could bear yet when she raised her eyes to look upon him noticing the enthusiasm with which he spoke seeing also how fair and handsome he was growing and how tall she told herself that for his own sake it would be well that she should have some protector stronger than herself for rapidly as the catholic religion was spreading in brittany there were many pagans and barbarians in the neighborhood heathen bards too who would certainly bear no good will towards a christian minstrel who in all his songs sang of his fair master christ and of the sweet mother who gave him birth long and earnestly did herve and his widowed mother talk of their prospects and of her brother Godfried, who long ago had retired in a solitary place in a neighboring forest where he lived the life of a hermit she indeed would be well content she said if her son placed herself in the care of so holy a man and so near a relation a person of some learning too was Godfried and in spite of the fact that he had sought out a very retired place and nothing but a little cell to live in all the boys of the neighborhood regularly flocked to him for instruction it is indeed a remarkable fact that the bretons and the irish were so keen after letters that no matter how remote the dwelling of a learned man might be they were always quick to discover him and eager to profit from his teaching as we have already seen when saint cadot and saint gildas took up their abode on a desert island the boys of brittany soon found them out and though the lads had to cross the sea in their corkles they sought nothing of the trouble and the peril of these daily journeyings if only they might acquire some tincture of divine and human wisdom Four. Herve must have started for his uncle's solitude long before the break of day, for, led by his faithful white dog, he arrived just as the morning sun was pouring a pool of light over the open space in front of the hermit's cell. The door was shut, but the boy knocked and the dog barked. 
Rising from his morning prayer, the solitary threw open the door. But for the presence of the dog, Gorfred would have mistaken his nephew for one of God's ministering spirits. Standing there in full light of the morning sun, his beautiful features surrounded by a halo of golden hair, and wearing that calm, rapt expression so often seen on the faces of the blind, Herve looked more like a radiant angel than a minstrel boy. Angel or mortal, I bless thee, exclaimed the hermit. A thousand times welcome art thou to my poor cell. And now, for some happy peaceful years, the poor lad's wanderings were over. Already his mother was clothed with the habit of religion, and right gladly did he offer his entire being to the good God she had taught him to love and to serve. Day by day he joined all the prayers and offices of his guardian. Day by day he sat beside the sturdy Breton lads who crowded to the hermitage and shared their every lesson. Very soon, and in spite of blindness, Herve surpassed every pupil in learning. From his beloved mother he had already learned much, and as we know, he had those gifts of creation and improvisation for which his minstrel father, the Wallum pupil of St. Cadot, had been distinguished. Marvelous grew the lad's memory, and though his eyes had never looked upon the written letter, his mind became stored with every kind of knowledge. Day by day the little hermitage rang with the music of harp and voice. With reverent admiration did Gorford's pupils listen to the blind boy's impassioned minstrelsy. Almost with awe would they make a circle about him under the trees of the woodland, and wait with rapt attention for the inspired music that so quickly rose to his lips. To have the privilege of leading him, to carry his harp, or to offer him any kind of service, these young Bretons were ready to fight one another. They brought him their ripest fruits and their sweetest smelling flowers. The pick of the autumn berries and the choicest of hazelnuts and filberts were poured into Herve's lap. When winter came, they brought him the whitest and warmest lambskin that they could procure, tunic and cloak of the fairest and thickest, content themselves with suits of goat skin and bands of undressed leather wrapped about their sturdy legs. They besought their mothers to make for Herve long stockings of leather, thick, supple, and lined with soft white lamb's wool. Utterly indifferent to the shape or fit of the wooden shoes they made for themselves, they vied with one another in turning out for Herve sabots of superior cut, of the lightest wood the forest afforded, and carved as to their insteps with quaint designs. Thus did they pay their school fees to the hermit, for he would receive no money from them, and for himself nothing but the plainest food and the coarsest garments. But he was glad that the poor, afflicted, yet thrice-blessed lad, who had come to him, should be warmed and filled, and in every way well-nourished. For Herb's earlier life had been a period of great privation, and the wonder was that so delicate a child should have survived those long years of penury and exposure, the time from seven to fourteen, when the child sought so hard, and not always successfully, to earn enough bread for his mother and for himself. 5. The happy years of pupilage rolled on, and Herve reached his twenty-first birthday. The youth should have a strong desire to visit his mother, seemed to the hermit uncle the most natural thing in the world. In fact, Gorford himself set out with his nephew to find the convent where his sister had taken the veil. It proved to be a sad, yet happy and fortunate visit. Herve was only just in time to receive his mother's blessing and to add to the exceeding blissfulness of her last moments. And now another great change was to come about in the life of the blind minstrel. His uncle was no longer young, and for some time past had longed to lead a more retired and recollected life. 
though my son you were deprived of bodily sight said gorfred to his nephew as they journeyed home your mind is unusually enlightened and your soul is flooded with the light that comes clown from the father of lights why should you not take up the work that after so many years of labor i must now lay down you suppress me both in learning and in holiness the lads love you and in reverence you and your influence upon them for good is enormous they will look after your every want all that you need they will most willingly bring to you if it be cox will you and yours my uncle said irv simply i am well content though it grieves me to the heart to lose you who for seven long years have been my father and my master so after a long and affectionate leave-taking the hermit passed away and sought a deeper solitude in which he hoped to prepare himself for that marvellous unending life of eternity upon which all his hopes were fixed generously and resolutely in spite of the double loss that wounded a specially sensitive heart herve set himself to the task of teaching well equipped he certainly was and in possession of all the gifts that a christian schoolmaster requires boys of every age and condition crowded to the hermitage school leaving it every evening as an old breton ballad puts it as noisily as a swarm of bees emerging from a hollow tree right glad was the master when the days of sunshine came and he could lead his troop of scholars into the open there in the midst of them would he sit his sightless but perfectly formed eyes raised to the sky and give them the benefit of all the learning with which his mind was filled lesson succeeded lesson music following arithmetic the holy scriptures came after virgil religious maxims in verse many of them resembling those aphorisms the great saint cadot had taught Irv's father were chanted to the strains of the harp better instruct a child than collect riches the idle boy is laying up misery for his old age who will not obey the rudder will have to obey the reef such were the maxims that he taught but above all he was anxious to give these rough lads a rule of christian life and for this end he composed a special poem which they learnt by heart and sang to a pleasing melody in this song they are instructed to offer their hearts and lives to god the very moment they awake from sleep make the sign of the cross and say my god i give thee my heart my body and my soul make me grow up a good man or let me die in my youth the same poem teaches them through the sights and sounds of nature they may raise their minds to higher things when you see a crow fly think of the black and evil devil who is ever ready to destroy you when you see a wood pigeon circling in the air think of your own guardian angel gentle and white and sweet when you behold the sun in the heavens think of the god who sees all things who like the sun gives warmth and light to the whole world and makes the wild roses grow upon the blue mountains and the perfumed violets in the green forests ever before sleep commend yourself to god that a white angel may come from heaven and watch over you through all the hours of darkness on to the golden dawn herve's great anxiety was to help his young scholars to pray regularly and well without some training in fixed habits of prayer and recollection he knew that religious teaching was of little worth and that without constant correspondence with heaven no theological virtue could lastingly flourish so he taught his boys how to exercise faith and hope and love and sorrow for sin and to look upon direct communication with the good god as one of life's greatest privileges it is any wonder that in the province of Brittany the Catholic faith took deep and lasting root.
six as time went on er's pupils grew into men and many of them became holy priests and monks what he had taught them when they were boys they were now ready and able to teach others indeed as the years rolled by he began to see that he was no longer necessary to the existence of the hermitage school and that it might be well if he left it in the hands of the quondam pupil and opened a place of learning in some more neglected district when a little girl suddenly appeared on the scene and claimed his protection as the daughter of his mother's sister her bade a sorrowful adieu to his weeping scholars and began to travel eastward Herve saw the hand of providence in the arrival of the homeless little Christina. When his faithful white dog died, he had not provided himself with another animal friend. And indeed, there was no need to do this when so many boys struggled for the privilege of leading him from place to place. Now that he was leaving the hermitage forever, this bright and intelligent little girl would act as his guide and assistant. To build a small religious house was his first purpose, a little monastery in which he would teach the young, and in whose neighborhood he could find a suitable lodging for his niece. Moreover, like the Saxon Aldhelm, he was a great believer in the ministry of song, and knew that he could teach Catholic doctrine very effectively by going about among the people harp in hand and with christian ballads upon his lips he could not well be a preacher for he had not even minor orders a teacher and a highly successful one he had already shown himself to be little as her wished to find himself at the head of a religious community he could not refuse the help of those who wished to join him in his good work and when in addition to the house and chapel that they soon managed to build they set to work to construct a little college of wattled broom for christina the good minstrel was glad at heart under a clump of willows beside a pool and beneath the shadow of the church stood the little maiden's beehive home and there she lived in great content having sole charge of the altar linen and all the decorations of the little house of god even she is commemorated in the ancient breton ballads one of which speaks of her flitting in and out of her little hive of a home singing and humming like a busy bee picking the choicest flowers she could find and arranging them for the adornment of the altar so sweet and sacred were the hymns she sang that while working within the church she did not refrain from chanting and often when she heard her voice her would make his way into the porch in order to listen and to bless god for the maiden's piety and innocence after some years so great became herve's fame for wisdom and for sanctity that when a council of breton bishops met at runbrea to condemn and to excommunicate an officer who was treating the poor with great harshness and injustice our hermit minstrel was not only invited to be present but was asked to pronounce the sentence the scene was a striking one barefoot and clad in goatskin the hermit stood in the center of seven bishops and many abbots each holding a lighted torch the wrongs done by the oppressor were many and great and all the prelates were agreed that the church's ban should be put upon him so mounting a rock the blind minstrel solemnly recited the sentence and the seven bishops responded with a triple amen every torch was instantly extinguished and the council broke up in silence for many happy years irv continued to teach and to sing both at home and abroad continuing to share his hermitage monastery with a number of devoted brethren and still the holy maiden christina continued to live in the little hive-like hut that stood so close to the door of the church but as the years passed by and irv began to grow old and feeble she could no longer lead him abroad nor might she visit him in the hermitage 
yet on sunny days he would come to the entrance of the church to give the maiden his blessing and to encourage her in the solitary and holy life she had so willingly adopted one day the hermit minstrel dragged himself thither for the last time christina he began feebly make up a little bed for me before the altar of god make it on the hard earth at the feet of jesus crucified give me a stone for boister and strew the couch with ashes for the time of my passing is nigh with much weeping the maiden obeyed him then she knelt beside him imploring him as a last favor to beg of god that she might follow him as the boat follows the ship my child god is the master was his reply it is he who sows the grain and reaps it when it is ripe for three days he lay before the altar and on the third surrounded by bishop and abbots and priests his holy soul passed to its rest and at the same moment christina bowed herself upon the feet of her uncle and died the boat had followed the ship into the heaven of eternity end of section 10 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc Section 11 of Miller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. A Mighty Struggle. Among the truly great men of the past, Augustine of Hippo holds high place. The man who worships mere intellect cannot but venerate Augustine. The worldly man cannot but be interested in one who for so many years was the prince of worldlings. True penitents regard him as their patron. Sinners who are yet tied and bound with the chain of sin will, if they are wise, ask for his intercession. In the year 354, Augustine was born of a pagan father and a Christian mother. His parents were fairly well-to-do, but by no means rich and the father was not slow to see that his boy was possessed of quite exceptional abilities. He first went to school in his native town of Tagest, not far from Hippo, in the African province of Numidia. Afterwards, he studied grammar, poetry, and rhetoric at Medora. The father's one ambition was that Augustine should be a great scholar. The mother's daily prayer was that her son should become a great saint. At the age of sixteen, the boy returned to his home, his father wishing him to find his studies at Carthage, but to the grief of Monica, in the lasting detriment of the lad, his father allowed him to spend a whole year in idleness. The reading of bad plays first corrupted his mind, the frequenting of theatres, and an excessive indulgence in field sports brought him into bad company, and led him into every sort of sin. In his seventeenth year, Augustine went to Carthage. It is a proof of his ardent nature, as well as of his amazing ability, that he threw himself into his studies with such application that he soon held the foremost place in the most famous schools of his country, yet his vices seemed to grow with his learning. Instead of checking the immoral course upon which he had entered, his studies increased his opportunities and occasions of sinning. Meanwhile, his holy mother Monica prayed. She herself had instructed her boy in the Catholic faith. He was not yet baptized but he was a catechumen. She had taught him to pray. As was the custom of that particular time, his baptism had been put off, lest the grace of it should be abused. A year after he had been sent to Carthage, his father died, after being received into the church. The widowed Monica still prayed. Of a certain character in the distinguished work of fiction, the author says, his soul was like some great cathedral organ, foully handled in the night by demons. The comparison may well be applied to Augustine. His intellect was colossal. Even non-Catholic authors claimed him as one of the greatest writers who ever lived. Great as an orator and a rhetorician, he was still greater as a thinker. His reasoning power was immense. No knowledge came amiss to him. He took up and absorbed almost every form of science. But if his intellect was strong and powerful, so were his passions. In that amazing book of his confessions, he has shown us something 
of the strife that went on within his soul for so many long years. We know that the battle was titanic. Good and evil fought desperately for the lasting possession of that great mind. He was by nature generous and refined. Even in his vices he observed a certain external decency, and his manners were irreproachable. Intensely proud, as at this time he was, he carefully refrained from the abusive language in which his companions indulged, and the practical joking so common among the Carthaginian students. To give pain to others afforded him no pleasure. Nonetheless, he lived in open sin and almost complete forgetfulness of God, but Monica still prayed. Restless and ill, at ease in spite of his scholastic success, he determined to devote himself to the study of philosophy. He began to have certain contempt for honors and riches. Learning and wisdom should give him the satisfaction that sensual pleasure could not supply. Yet he made little or no change in his life. The habit of moral sin was still upon him. Philosophy could show him how to reason concerning his passions. It could not help him to overcome them. As his knowledge increased, his pride also increased. To his many mortal sins, he was to add that of heresy. Hitherto he had been a Christian in name, retaining a certain reverence for Christ, and remaining mindful of the teaching of his saintly mother, but long-continued habits of sensuality had blinded his spiritual understanding and greatly weakened his will. To the intense grief of Monica, he joined the sect of the Manichees, remaining in it for his nineteenth to his twenty-eighth year. It was a monstrous and ridiculous heresy, that of Manichaeism, and the fall of so great a genius into so foolish and deadly an error was the direct outcome of his pride and impurity. He fell as Solomon fell, as Luther fell, as Henry the Eighth fell, as almost every heresiarch has fallen. A great sorrow fell upon Augustine. His dearest friend, and one who had followed him into heresy, fell sick, and was received back into the Catholic Church. He rallied for a time, and Augustine ridiculed his friend's conversion. If you wish to remain my friend, said the sick man, you must not make fun of my religion. Soon afterwards he died very happily, and Augustine's grief was terrible. He could do nothing but weep, and his life became insupportable. Philosophy could give him no relief. Knowledge had no cure for a loss of this kind. Sensual pleasures became a torment. He could no longer remain at Tagest, where for some years he had conducted a school of grammar and rhetoric, and determined to remove to the great capital of Carthage. Here he gained distinction and applause in public disputations, and secured the principal prizes of oratory and poetry. Time and new friends mitigated his grief. Soon, however, the disorderly conduct of the students disgusted him, and he determined to go to Rome. There he fell dangerously ill. Recovering, he began to lecture, the most famous scholars of the day, frequenting his schools. Still restless and annoyed at the knavery of some of his pupils who cheated him of his fees, he sought and obtained a royal appointment, that of the professor of rhetoric at Milan. Though St. Monica did not know it, this was the moment for which she had prayed. This was the beginning of the end of Augustine's apostasy and immorality. To be in the city of Milan without hearing of the holiness and eloquence of its bishop was impossible. Out of mere curiosity, and to indulge his love of rhetoric, Augustine went to hear St. Ambrose preach. Almost insensibly, Monica's son was impressed. He went to criticize, he remained to think. The manner of the holy bishop's sermons attracted the great rhetorician. The matter of them sank into his heart. He was a man of God, who could reason. The most famous among the Manichees could only talk. Augustine was deeply moved, but he was not yet converted, yet Monica still prayed. The enemy held my will, Augustine afterwards wrote, and of it he made a chain, with which he had fettered me fast. From a perverse will was created wicked desire or lust, and the serving this lust produced a kind of necessity, with which, as with certain links fastened one to another, I was kept close shackled in this cruel slavery. If the forming of bad friendships is always a sure occasion of sin, as it certainly is, the making of friends with really good people is a special antidote to vice. Augustine began to pull himself in a way of holy men, as formerly he had sought out the wicked. Not even then 
was his conversion immediately assured. But he had taken the first grand step in the right direction, and all this time Monica was praying. From good friends to good books is an easy step. As a young boy, bad books had seduced Augustine, corrupt plays had led him into wicked company. He now began to read the sublime epistles of St. Paul in the lives of the saints. These writings powerfully affected him, but the struggle still went on. Hell was enraged at the idea of losing a soul so powerful for good or harm, a soul that had served it so faithfully for so many long years. I was enraged at myself, he says, that I did not courageously and at once resolve on what my reason convinced me was the good and necessary thing to be done. I shook my chain, but I could not be released from it. But he continued to seek out holy men. He went on reading good books. He had already abandoned the Manichaean heresy, and his mother had followed him to Milan, for tenderly and devotedly as she loved him. While he remained a heretic, she would not live in his house, but she never ceased to pray for him. Who shall describe her happiness or his when the day of his deliverance came? It came in the year 386, when he was 32 years old. In great retirement, mother and son lived together, giving themselves to prayer and the practice of a holy life. On the following Easter Eve, Augustine was baptized by St. Ambrose, and in November of the same year, St. Monica died. Augustine became a priest, and subsequently a bishop. He remains one of the greatest of God's saints. He died on the 28th of August, 430, in his 77th year. End of section 11. Section 12 of Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. St. Bernard and the Knights, a Lenten Story. 1. Gloom of a rigorous Lent, and the time of the Passion nigh, Gay knights on pleasure bent passing Clairvaux by, Riding to tournament. 2. Nightfall in a lonely waste, Shall they pause at the abbey gate, Or gallop ahead in haste, Hoping for better fate than a fasting fair to taste? 3. Did their angels lead them in? Well, an angel met them there, And from buttery and ben, Brought forth not monkish fare, A bait their souls to win. 4. I ask of you a truce, The holy Bernard cried. Do not let the Lent abuse, And the day your Saviour died, But each had his excuse. 5. A truce till Lent is o'er? Nay, for the lists are spread. Then shall I pray the more, the holy abbot said, pausing the wine to pour. 6. Pausing to bless the bulls. I have begged of God a boon. Now drink to the health of your souls. May he grant my favor soon, whose power the world controls. 7. Anon they rode away, but the wine had failed to cheer. The gayest of the gay were filled with dread and fear, the dullest with dismay. 8. Each scanned his fellow's face. Lo, each was traced with tears. Riding at funeral pace, they told their faults and fears, first movement of sweet grace. 9. The abbot o'er his wine hath cast a secret charm. It is a spell divine. The leader in alarm to halt had made the sign. 10. Turning they spur, they fly back to the abbey gate. Lighting they kneel and cry, Say not we came too late, here would we live and die. End of section 12